Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Saturday. I hope that the weekend is treating you well. Um, I'm, um, so today I'll be talking a bit about managing mental health in the workplace. Uh, so we all know, hold on, let me just get my slides going. We, know, we all know about stress, right? It's pretty common knowledge. Uh, we do know the common signs and symptoms of stress, so I won't really dwell too much on this slide. But essentially, um, if you see, for example, unhealthy changes you know, in your behavior that are out of the norm, meaning like, you know, you're not sleeping as well, la, not eating as well, drinking more alcohol, for example, your concentration is worse, uh, you know, stomach ache, la, you know, medicating a little bit more to sleep, you know, having more mood swings. These are all signs of, of stress. Um, and really the list of symptoms are, are endless. Okay. So instead of just reading all these signs and symptoms, right, and how we can cope, um, I want to um, just make sure that we're all uh, taking care of ourselves. Okay, so be, for example, just really checking in with yourself, being aware of what you're feeling, you know, um, actively sitting down and carving out time in your schedule to do something that recharges you um, and do this as something that is uh, a non-negotiable. Okay, so in my first poll, okay, what I want everyone to do is I'm going to share a poll here uh, in the chat function and I want everyone to tell me what you do at your workplace to manage your stress. Okay, just one thing or uh, two things if you want, just feel free. So go to pollev.com and then type in catco as the user, or you can just click on the link, um, click on the link that I've sent in the chat. So I'll give everyone a minute to go into this and then start sending in your responses. Ventilate, okay, ventilate to coworkers, I love that. Eat snacks, very good, okay. So eating is my favorite. Drink day tare. Fantastic. I have a suspicion I know who, who submitted this. Setting boundaries, exercise, fantastic. Take a walk. Okay, very good. Fresh air, you know, clears the mind. Yeah, sleep. Excellent. My favorite one. I do this um, all the time. Have a really good shower. Okay, so hot or cold water. Uh, really up to you. Go out for a walk. Okay, fantastic. So I'm going to kind of stop this here. Um, so take regular breaks. Very good. Okay, uh, let me just lock this. Okay, so I see all of these wonderful um, stress management techniques that all of us have. Um, so I want to share a story with you, okay, um, about why this may not always be uh, enough, okay? So I like to pose this question to everybody, and because that I can't really get interaction through a webinar, I'm just going to tell you the scenario and what uh, the response I usually get. So I usually go up to someone and I say, uh, what would you do if I'm trying to hit on you, okay? And I am trying to get you to join my company. But I say that the catch is if you join my company, you will have to sit at this, this desk every single day. And next to the desk, there's this pipe. Lah, okay? And the pipe is spewing these toxic fumes. Okay? But no problem. I will give you a mask to wear every single day. I'll give you fresh new mask. Okay? Um, and uh, the chance of you getting lung cancer is about 80%. Yeah? The pipe is also damn noisy. Okay? Very, very noisy. And the chance of you going deaf or getting some hearing kind of thing, right, is about 75%. But if, okay, you join me, I will pay you triple your pay, okay? And if you get sick, I will give you the best uh, doctors that you can ask for. I'll give you the best hearing aid to help you when you're deaf, okay? Would you join my company? So the most common answer that I get is absolutely not, no way, right? And I ask them, how much money must I pay you in order to come and join my company? And usually they say, no, no amount of money is enough, yeah? So when I ask them, what do I have to do? What do I have to fix in my company to make you come and join me, right? And so the obvious answer is fix your pipe, lah, right? Fix the pipe and I will join you, right? So it's so blindingly obvious when this is, uh, it's so glaringly obvious, sorry, when there is a threat to our physical health and we know that no amount of money can convince us to join or stay in that company. It doesn't make sense, right? But it, what if I were to tell you that lots of companies are actually doing this today, but with our mental health. They go, oh, come and join me. Work long hours, la. I stress you to the bone, la. work you until you want to die. La. But then suddenly, if you get depression, free counselling, okay? Free stress management talk for everybody, right? The company cares about you. Yeah. And so I'm not saying uh, that these interventions are not good. Okay. These things like stress management, mindfulness, counseling, they're all very, very important to have in place. But these interventions are usually more downstream, right? And um, are used to support staff that are already starting to show signs of distress. So we need to start looking more upstream to fix the problem at the source 
and ask what is causing me to become sick in the first place, right? What is causing my colleagues to become sick in the first place? And how do I fix the pipe instead of waiting for myself to get sick, right? So it's really just like this guy, uh, do, like doing stress management, right? They're cutting the grass, but they're not really digging it out at the roots. And it'll just go on forever and ever and it'll keep growing back if we don't fix it at the source. And so NUS really recognizes this, right? Um, and it really involves way more than having a range of programs and strategies. Because oftentimes, right, when you take an ad hoc program approach, the positive effects of these programs are often temporary and uh, having sustained employee mental health is not achieved. It's like putting a plaster on a massive crack and thinking, oh, solve the problem, right? So we need to go beyond this and synchronize our efforts across the organization to keep conversations about mental health going. And so this is why the NUS team developed the wellness framework that systematically helps us identify potential gaps in our well-being support services. The framework recognizes that well-being exists on a spectrum and it helps us map out the different stages of a person's well-being journey from well to at-risk states to diseased and recovery phases. So the framework was designed to help organizations think of how they can support each um, employee at each of these stages. And very often we see companies fail to recognize the at-risk groups and the people in recovery. Yeah. So therefore we see things like a lot of solo EAP programs just popping up, which often isn't enough to address the systemic issues or help uh, with preventing the problem. Okay, so once you have the well-being journey mapped out, we wanted to make sure that the organization was accountable on three different levels. The culture and leadership level is very important. The second level is having the right systems and infrastructure in place to support well-being at work. And lastly, having the right support services and resources in place for the individuals at each well-being stage. So then we systematically mapped out the types of intervention we have for each level, okay, and the corresponding stakeholders in charge. Um, I would say the most important thing um, is that your leadership is involved and they come together and they commit to developing and implementing a strategy for mental health that caters to the entire spectrum. Um, another example under systems and infrastructure is flexi policies. And you can see that there are different policies catered for different people at different stages of their well-being journey. Uh, and the same for the support services and resources where you have peer support and coaching for more of the well and at-risk groups, and then more external professional services for the ill groups and um, return to work support services for those in recovery who want to readjust back to the workplace. As you can see, um, there should be multiple departments collaborating. Okay, so you must have your wellness teams, your HR teams, your safety teams all working together. Um, and uh, because this goes way beyond a HR function and you need close collaboration between all stakeholders. Yeah. So basically this slide is just to show how complex it can get. The one at NUS is I think three times as complex as this once you've mapped everything out. Uh, and once you have the whole picture of what services you have, you're able to look and see where are the gaps and what can I do to improve my system, right? And of course, lastly, we have the effectiveness color, uh, column but we can review and measure effectiveness through the different uh, performance indicators. All right. So what has been stressing people out then, right? We've all been thrown so many challenges the last two years. We've got to adapt to home-based learning, la, remote working. Um, but the top struggle by far was not being able to unplug and the stress that results from that, okay? Um, in terms of uh, remote, uh, working remotely. Yeah. So the top struggle. Um, yeah. So, yes. Yeah, so they studied over 2,300 remote workers all over the world. And they say that even though there were many perks from working from home, like, you know, reduce commuting time, they find that the boundaries are blurring and they don't know when to switch off. So almost about 50% of respondents also say they felt like they were working more now from home as opposed to working from the office. What's also very worrying uh, is that there is a large bulk of people saying that they're finding it harder to communicate over video and they feel more lonely. So this is especially true for uh, our international colleagues who may not have family here or for those that live alone or starting a new job, you know, that, and then their workplace relationships are not established yet or even for extroverts who are suddenly unable to hang out with colleagues at work. And even if we're getting um, on Zoom a lot, right, and getting so much social engagement through this meeting, the type of connection um, still leaves us feeling lonely. It's just not the same, right? We hang out after calls. We don't really say to chit-chat after. 
So really working from home requires us to be intentional about fostering the connection that we need. So needless to say, uh, uh, because of this pandemic and lockdowns, we're seeing surges of mental health issues, loneliness, stress in Singapore. Uh, we recorded the highest number of suicide cases. Okay, we've seen in eight years amidst the COVID pandemic. Uh, and this was a 13% increase from uh, 2019, where we saw 400 cases. So now more than ever, we need to focus on taking care of our mental health and look out for one another to build strong support networks. Okay, so why is support so important? Building strong support networks is very essential. Uh, I really hate the term social distancing. What they really mean is that we should be physically distancing, uh, but still staying socially connected with our loved ones and our colleagues. Humans need social connection. We all have different appetites for how much um, social interaction and connection we need. But no matter where we fall on this continuum, right, everybody feels lonely sometimes. But when our continual or uh, chronic loneliness right, uh, uh, kicks in, that's when it can start to have serious consequences on our physical and mental health. So I've got a couple more studies for you. Okay, a study showed that lonely workers take twice as many sick days okay, and demonstrate less commitment and weaker performance. Um, their emotions can also spread to others, okay, causing a ripple effect of loneliness throughout the organization. Loneliness has also been found to be as predictive of life expectancy as um, obesity, okay, high blood pressure, and smoking 15 sticks of cigarettes a day. Okay, that's pretty crazy. So my next question that I have for you okay, on Paul EV is true or false, having a best friend at work makes you twice as likely than others to engage fully in your work. Come. Okay, all the answers coming. True, 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 true. Everybody's saying true. Fantastic. Very good. Oh, some false. Okay, some false is coming in. <laughs> all right. Maybe I'll give it a few more seconds before I close off the poll. Okay, I can see that majority of you guys think that it's true. Uh, okay, so let me just close this off. All right, so what is the answer? So I hate to break it to you guys, but um, this is actually not true, okay? Um, everyone gets so, so, so shocked by this and they go, how was the actual number? How can it not be true, right? Besties are the best, right? So a study by Gallup actually found that people with a best friend at work are seven times as likely than others to engage fully in their work um, and that close work relationships boost employee satisfaction and well-being by 50%. It's nuts, right? So why are friends so effective at increasing engagement, right? So we find that friends actually make us more creative, more productive, as casual, friendly banter and talks can really turn into very innovative discussions about ways you can improve things. When we feel safe with our friends, we open up, okay? We're more creative, we're more experimental, we're more collaborative. Friends watch out for us, okay? They provide a sounding board. They provide emotional support when we have a really bad day. Um, and they really try and stick up for you and push and advocate for you when uh, you know you need to get something done, right? So it's pretty clear that telecom communication and remote work is here to stay. So how can we improve the quality of our connections and our check-ins, okay? What is really interesting is that we find that 75% um, of millennials born, uh, so these are people born between 1981 and 1995, uh, so thank God I'm still a millennial. Um, they, they actually say that um, they prefer texting over talk. And we find that the generation right before them actually prefer calling. Okay, so the, the older generation prefers to talk on the phone while millennials prefer to text. Um, you know, they say it's less disruptive, less stressful. Uh, I can multitask more, I can go back and refer and check and then think of my reply. And they really like frequent engagement, okay, with um, efficient exchanges. Yeah. So let's look over here under the GIF. Okay, a lot of people like to use so many different um, acronyms and they just get progressively harder. So I tried to put all these really confusing things right into a, into a little chat and see if y'all can understand this. Okay, so just have a look and, and see if y'all can decipher. Yeah, I'm gonna give y'all like, like a couple of seconds. It's ridiculous. If anyone can understand this whole thing, I clap for you, okay? So uh, T-I-L, you do H-O-T-O -O from me. So it's today I learned, okay? 
you'll do a handover takeover for me, right? So lol, everyone knows this, laugh out loud. Are you for real? Okay, shake my head, SMH, okay? Yes, um, for what it's worth, FWIW for is worth, I can go through all my reports with you. Okay, then TBH is to be honest, uh, it's too much info, TMI. I, okay, must be careful with this, uh, CBB. I always say it the wrong way, so I cannot be bothered. Uh, and then this one just kills me, right? SFLR, sorry for late reply. CTN, cannot talk now in a meeting. Okay, good luck, have fun. Okay, got to go, talk to you later. My God, right? Like when I saw this, I was just, I might be a millennial, but I just didn't understand 80% of this. Um, I was discussing this with my colleague, Heikel, who's actually in this call today. And we were just saying we miss the days when it was just LOL and roll on floor laughing, R-O-F-L. Now it's just, wow, so much, right? So it also shows, studies have also shows, right, that despite our love for texting, um, face-to-face -face exchanges and in-depth conversation are still the most influential and it makes for much better emotional connection. It showed that just by hearing the voices of people that you trust, okay, can provide some comfort and emotional support. So what they did was they had a study of like two groups of girls, okay, the girls were all really stressed. And one group, they say, you can text your mother, right? The other group, they say, okay, you can call your mother, call them or you can FaceTime them, whichever you prefer, right? So what they actually found was really fascinating. The girls that could only text their mom, okay, um, found that there was no reduction of stress hormones and there was no release um, of the feel-good hormone oxytocin, right? And oxytocin is this uh, hormone that uh, gets produced when you feel loved, when you feel hugged. But the opposite was found for girls who were able to hear their moms or see their mom's faces. So meaning the stress hormones decreased and they had more oxytocin, feel-good hormone released. So it's really important that we have these visual and audio cues to establish a deeper emotional connection. But of course, physical meetups are still the best. Huh? Okay, so my last poll for the day, right? What is the optimal number of hours an employee should spend with their manager each week to maximize engagement? Zero. Very funny. I love it. Zero. Totally don't need to see boss. <laughs> well, who put zero? Must find out who you are. <laughs> Okay, one hour is a popular favorite, right? Uh, nobody's choosing 10 hours. It's very interesting. 10 hours a week, your boss might be, wow, can quit already. Okay, so two hours and one hour is a hot favorite. Four hours, wow. Okay. It's very funny. Every time I talk to managers about this, um, managers always say, uh, you know, one hour. Okay, two hours, but whenever I talk to staff, they always go zero hours. Okay, so I'm just going to close off this poll. So what is this magic number? Okay, the magic number is six hours. Shocking, right? When I first heard this, I thought, this is ridiculous. Let it might as well just move into my, boss, my boss's house, right? Live with him. It also means that if you have a really big team, uh, this is not possible. If you have more than seven people, right? You cannot do this already. But I must caveat that um, six hours is not face-to-face -face chats. Okay, it can be made out of phone calls, emails, team meetings, informal huddles, texting. And data shows that, you know, this falls below six hours. People think my manager is disengaged. If it's over six hours, they are micromanaging. But at this six-hour sweet spot, people are more inspired, more engaged, more motivated and innovative. Okay, but then we also tend to get uh, responses like this, right? When I ask, hey, how are you? Everyone just goes, okay, good, good, good. Can, can, yeah, very, uh, uh, sure, I'm all right, I'm all right, right? And nobody likes to admit that they cannot cope, right? So like people are afraid of seeming like they're really not competent or weak if they say that I'm not okay. They're afraid, uh, you know, it might affect my performance, right? I don't feel close enough to open up to you, for example. Uh, and then when they say they're okay, people go, oh, great, can you help me take more, right? And then they just dump some more work on them, yeah? What's worse, okay? Uh, oh, sorry, let me just skip this slide. Hold on. Yeah, what's worse um, is that uh, we tend to glorify unhealthy work behaviors, right? Uh, we all know a colleague who works late every day and they always look like they're dying, right? And then people go, wow, you're working so hard. And wow, send in your tree and my rates are yeah, very good, huh? okay? Um, or it's like some sick competition where they go, I worked 15 hours straight. And you go, I worked two days straight there. Eh? And we often confuse overworking with having a strong work ethic, right? And that assumption in itself is problematic. 
Employees feel that they need to work themselves to burn out to prove their worth. But this mindset and behaviors need to be actively challenged and we need to stop glamorizing overwork. So don't let it become a culture that everybody is used to, okay? Okay, so what can we do? I would say actively take time to listen, right? And challenge unhealthy work behaviors. Instead of just asking, are you okay? Ask more specific questions, right? Like, um, is there anything I can help you with? What are your biggest challenges right now? Okay, share with me, think about it beforehand and we can have a discussion about it, right? If six hours is too much, I would say start with having one good meaningful conversation and then customize that accordingly based on your colleagues needs right and talk about stuff beyond work right ask about their lives outside of work and uh, build a culture of feedback by debriefing after um, dif different projects so i would say really try to be um, consistent about this uh, if you suddenly check in very randomly people tend to get suspicious uh, and i must share this story with you um, Okay, so uh, the habit of me reaching out actually doesn't come naturally to me. It's a conscious effort that I make, and it's only something that I developed in recent years. Uh, I come from a family of introverts, and I've only developed uh, uh, this habit of just checking in uh, recently. So um, many years ago, my mom, uh, she, she likes to write in our family group chat, right, uh, sweet messages in the morning, and she finds these really, really grainy photos, okay, on Google. If not grainy, she don't like. She must choose the most grainy blur photos ever with an inspo quote on it okay and then she will write a message to us good morning my dear children she got four children right uh, I love you so much uh, and I really really uh, hope you have a wonderful day right and she'll send it one in the morning one at night kids these days uh, so I mean uh, we are so busy we all go to work right uh, we got so used to it we just didn't reply and I'm so ashamed to see this right for at least three to four months not a single child replied her okay I give this talk really often and uh, I just was giving the talk one day and I just kept thinking, I'm such a hypocrite, right? I um, tell everyone to reach out, connect and everything uh, and I don't even reply to my own mother. So one day uh, I uh, just reply to her and I say, thanks mom for your messages. I love you very much uh, for all of this effort, right? I really appreciate you. Within five minutes, she gives me a call on my handphone, my mother, right? She goes, girl, what happened? Someone die, is it? Okay, she actually thought someone had died uh, because uh, people were responding to her. She got so suspicious. And so that was when I told myself, okay, I have to make this more consistent and reciprocate and reach out. Yeah. Um, okay, so what are some other unhelpful responses, right? Uh, what should we um, avoid saying? I think really being sincere about it instead of just saying, you know, how are you? Uh, it's okay, everything will be okay, right? Um, uh, people sometimes say things like, you know, it's okay, I never have to worry about you. You always sort things out in the end. And these statements, while said with really good intentions, uh, can make someone feel really isolated and feel worse or even more pressurized to live up to their standards. Or just saying, uh, ah, yeah, it's working late, I just go home, just go home without really understanding the context or what they have to go through, right? Um, so actions really, you know, I guess, uh, speak louder than words and really be genuine with your questions. Right. Another one uh, that uh, people always say is, you know, uh, don't uh, be dismissive or trivialize their emotions, saying things like it's all in your head, just shake it off. It's telling someone with depression, just shake it off. It's like saying, oh, you broke your leg. Ah. Just walk it off, lah. walk it off. Yeah. So try not to say, you know, oh, like this is also you could stress, ah. like this is also depressed. Ah. Right. Try not to do that. Um, another one, one of my favorites right okay is um, shifting the focus on yourself so saying things like when they're sharing something and you feel oh my god I can I relate to this saying things like oh my gosh me too yes you know when this happened to me yesterday this was what happened and this was how I felt and it kind of hijacks the conversation right and becomes all about you and now you are supporting um, them right okay so I'm going to quickly move through this because I know my time is um, almost up right? Uh, try not to uh, blame um, or judge or accuse, you know, saying things like, why do you do that though, right? But isn't that your fault? Uh, how can you be so irresponsible or selfish? You know, your family and your colleagues um, need you, right? So try not to um, word it in those ways, yeah? So my key takeaways for today is, number one, try to identify an activity that will help you and really commit to doing that. Um, identify the sources of stress as well, okay, on top of self-care, and really um, try and eliminate or minimize as much as possible. 
And lastly, connect because you care and really be genuine uh, and be present um, and really try and listen actively. Yeah. So one resource that I will share with you in the chat, okay, is a manager's guide. Um, so I will share this um, in the chat in a little bit uh, for you guys to use with a checklist. Uh, and that actually brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your time.